do what you want. Okay, one more minute. We're going to be starting up at the expo stage. So good morning, everyone. I'm going to kick things off over here at the expo stage. My name is Melanie Roberts. I'm the Director of State and Regional Affairs for Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. I was part of the local planning committee for AAAS, and they asked us to tell you all about the science we do here in the region. Um, so based on 2016 data, Washington State ranks fifth in the nation in the number of R&D dollars we get from the federal government, both in absolute dollars and per capita. And today you'll hear from the two institutions who get the most R&D dollars. Uh, we have a lot of other institutions in the state as well, and if we had more than a half an hour, we'd have a lot of people up here. Um, instead, we have uh, our local science uh, editor who will tell us about the rest of the R&D going on here. Um, so let me introduce the panelists and I'll turn it over to them. So Tony Perung in the middle here is Deputy Director for Science and Technology at Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. His responsibility is setting strategy for our multidisciplinary research portfolio, tech transfer, and research partnerships. And until recently, he led PNNL's National Security Directorate, overseeing programs in nuclear nonproliferation and cybersecurity, among many others. Carrie Harwood is Associate Vice Provost for Research and, ex and External Relations at the University of Washington. Um, she's also the Geraldine Lynn Grinston Endowed Professor in Microbiology. She's an elected member of National Academy of Sciences, AAAS, very good, and the American Academy of Microbiology. And she is member at large for Section G. Um, her PhD is in microbiology. Tony's a physicist. And Alan Boyle from GeekWire is a science journalist. He, um, he holds a master's in science journalism from Columbia. He worked before GeekWire, which is our local science and tech publication. He worked for MSNBC, NBC News Digital. And he's especially well known for his reporting on space. Um, he's received multiple awards, including the AAAS Journalism Award, National Academies Awards, and more. And with that, I would like to turn it over to our panelists to tell us more about the great science that's going on in our region. Thank you. All right, good morning. So I represent the government laboratory portion of this panel, and I first want to start with just a few comments about Seattle itself. Um, the Brookings Institution, some years ago, put out a report titled The Rise of Innovation Districts, A New Geography of Innovation. And the claims in this report were that there was essentially a nonlinear benefit to being near concentrated innovation power, which is exactly what I believe we have here in Seattle, and that is what their report found. They found that these innovation districts, of which there were of the order of 10 across the country, drove the economic recovery after 2008 and are, are an, an amazing economic engine even today. Um, Seattle clearly has this going on. Um, federal gross domestic product numbers indicate that Seattle is the fastest growing eco economy in a large metropolitan area in the United States. And I would claim that talent and innovation talent in particular is the key to all this. There's a lot of smart people here, a lot of innovators, and a lot of research and development. So government-funded research and development generally is in the public interest. It, it focuses on things that you might regard as critical national capability. While education is not strictly our mission, there are times when we have to educate. We might do that through partnership with WSU or the University of Washington or others around the country. Um, a perfect example of that today would be machine learning. You cannot hire enough people to deploy to machine learning development and application, so we educate them as well in our lab. Um, similarly, we partner with industry. Even though profit is not our goal, particularly for us to make money, 
supporting the U.S. economy is a mission of the Department of Energy and federal research generally. So we partner with industry as well. In the region, in the Seattle area, there's various government laboratories. I'll just mention a few. There's uh, laboratories with the, the Noce National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, the USGS, the State Department of Ecology, the U.S. Forest Service. There is actually at the University of Washington a, an, an entity embedded within it called the Applied Physics Lab, which is largely Defense Department funded. And then, of course, there's my laboratory, which is funded by the Department of Energy and a variety of other sponsors, but it's mainly the Department of Energy. We are the largest government laboratory in the region, about 5,000 staff. So as a national laboratory, there are 17 Department of Energy laboratories. We're one of those. There are 10 of those that are Office of Science stewarded, which means our fundamental goal is to advance science and leverage science for various government missions. The history of national laboratories is they were founded over various decades, but really the motivation arose in the 1930s and 40s when the country saw that if you put a lot of money and some patience and a lot of smart people in, in, in one place, you got amazing things like particle accelerators or, or the innovations that won World War II. So that's really what created the National Lab System. The, one that cr the innovation that created Pacific Northwest National Laboratory ultimately was the Manhattan Project and the scale up of the production of plutonium in World War II by a factor of a billion in 18 months. That's what they did at Hanford. Now, PNNL today has nothing to do with Hanford, but our historical roots are connected with what happened in, in World War II in Eastern Washington. So today, PNNL has four missions. They are, number one, accelerate the rate of innovation. That's our fundamental science mission. Enable energy resilience and sustainability. Enable effective environmental assessment and remediation. And support national security, which Really, our focus there is reducing the threat from weapons of mass destruction, or what we might term weapons of mass effect more generally, things like cyber attacks and planes flying into buildings being included in that, in that list. We are located primarily in Richland, Washington, which is about a three-hour drive southeast of here, but also in Seattle, in Portland, in a place called Squim, which is about 90 minutes northwest of here on the Olympic Peninsula, and then there's staff scattered around the world. So, as I uh, move to the second half here. So I'll just give you a quick drive-by look. It's a very diverse place, but I'll give you some examples of the highlights of what we do, and then I'll, I'll wrap up with a comment on why Seattle is so important to us. So a major focus is fundamental and applied chemical science. Catalysis and chemical transformations are the key to the future for fuels, for emissions control, particularly carbon emission control, waste processing, recycling, and a whole host of things that are the that are the keys to sustainability in the 21st century. So we are trying to advance the fundamental science there and then drive it towards impact. Um, there's a great focus on environmental science with application to environmental cleanup and understanding ecosystems of importance to climate science. That's a major focus. We do both fundamental and applied biological science with applications to human health and countering advanced bio threats such as what synthetic biology is potentially enabling. We do a lot of work in energy technology, such as next generation nuclear reactors, advanced electric grid control, energy storage, renewable integration, uh, energy efficiency, and much more. And then finally, we work in an area, I just don't know what to call it, other than disruptive innovations, disruptive technologies. There's a whole host of things, such as artificial intelligence, automation, communications, massively interconnected systems, and things of that sort. We both drive and advance those technologies. We leverage those technologies for a variety of missions. And at times, we cope with those technologies, as in the example of cybersecurity. So why is Seattle important to us? Because again, innovation is more and more commercial. We cannot be the leading innovators in, in areas as we could have been as government-funded research labs in the 1950s. We, today, we are important. We are key for the US government, but we cannot be the leading innovators. We have to partner, and we do that Seattle is a major aid for us in doing that. Um, our presence in Seattle has grown by almost a factor of 10 in the last 10 years here in Seattle, and I think it's going to continue to grow. It's a very, it's a just a, as I said at the beginning, it's the innovation here is red hot, and we want to be a part of it. So we have a vision of our our laboratory as having this sort of hybrid campus where we're in a traditional location where high risk, operationally challenging work goes on, such as Eastern Washington, combined with everything you get by being in Seattle. Um, so it's just key to our future. And I'm actually done. I want to uh, plug, there's a booth, I think, right over there that's a PNL booth. Please go check it out. And uh, with that, I'll turn it over to um, the next panelist.
Thanks, Tony. <laughs> um, let's see. Okay. Uh, I'm Carrie Harwood from the University of Washington. And um, this is an image of our main campus, which is about three miles north of here. It's about 600 acres in size. Um, it's within walking distance because I have walked from there to here. Um, and there are also another number of other locations in downtown Seattle where we have research labs because we just don't have enough space on the main campus. Um, most notably, uh, we have a big presence now at South Lake Union, which is kind of near the Space Needle. It's where Amazon is as well. Um, and so there's a burgeoning and new and expanding medical, uh, uh, medical school campus for research in that area. Um, the University of Washington is a public university um, with a global reach. And we have about 45,000 students on the main campus, um, a lot of students. And we have a very big research enterprise. Um, UD, UW, as we call it, is the fourth biggest employer in Seattle after Boeing, which is huge, uh, Amazon, and Microsoft. Um, so we, we're a very big presence. Um, so to do a little bit of bragging, um, 49 of our graduate programs are ranked uh, in the top 10. Uh, according to U.S. News and World Report, and that's globally. And I'll just mention a few of them uh, that are in the top 10. Those would include computer science, biostatistics, speech and language, artificial intelligence, um, and uh, environmental policy, biomedical engineering, genome science, and of course, my department and program, which is microbiology, which is ranked number two globally. Um, so um, we are really a research powerhouse. Um, in fact, at, at South Lake Union, we have um, P, uh, PNNL, PNNL has a lab at South Lake Union. Um, so very close ties with uh, UW there. Uh, so we do bring in a lot of dollars, more than a billion a year, um, from uh, total external funding. And um, about three quarters of this is from the National Institutes of Health, because we're very um, strong in the biomedical sciences at UW. Um, and I just want to mention a couple of areas of strength and initiatives that we currently have underway. One is in uh, population health. Uh, we're just finishing building a population health building, thanks to the Gates Foundation. And um, this, is this initiative is focused on improving the well-being of entire communities to improve human health, environmental resilience, and social and economic equality. We also have an in a very um, big Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation, which uses a global network of collaborators to assess disease and health conditions in communities. Uh, even down to the neighborhood level and to help poli policymakers and health professionals work with communities to improve well-being. Um, and we also are, have a very big presence in global health. Um, uh, Seattle is um, an epicenter of um, computer tech, computer-related tech. It's also an epicenter of global health. Um, and I think... Um, that we'll hear more about that in the next in the next talk from uh, Alan. Um, and then finally, innovation. Uh, uh, we have an innovation imperative at UW, and we'd like to think that we were sort of the original innovators because we were here first. Um, and of course, Bill Gates depended on the 
computers at um, UW when he was a grad uh, when he was a, a high school student. He lived within walking distance of the UW computers, so he made um, very um, uh, very good use of them. Um, so we're really fortunate to be located in one of the most innovative regions in the world, um, and we really struggle struggle every year to educate enough computer scientists to meet the demand in the region. Um, and, but also the UW faculty have a history of innovation. We have a culture of innovation. I can say that because I came from another university and I immediately noticed a big difference. Um, and what's really neat about uh, UW is the innovation is from the grassroots up. It's not, it's not a top-down thing. And so it's a very exciting place to work um, and to study and to educate. Thank you. OK. Uh, my name is Alan Boyle. I'm aerospace and science editor for GeekWire, uh, which is a tech site here in Seattle. And my role here is to serve as the cleanup hitter uh, you've heard about uh, how PNNL and University of Washington are contributing to the research landscape in Seattle. And it's very much an ecosystem. I think you've already gotten the idea that, that all these uh, institutions are working together. Uh, Seattle has uh, quite a reputation in the development of technology and innovation, and that's because of what I would think of as the ABCs, aerospace, biotech, and computer science. And so we're just going to go through a few of the other institutions that are in those spaces and maybe give you an idea of what's going on in this region and how it connects to your interests. First in aerospace, of course, Boeing is uh, the largest uh, commercial employer in uh, Washington state. And uh, that's gone for more than a century. Boeing recently marked its 100-year uh, anniversary and has spun off quite a few uh, ventures for their supply chain as well as on the final frontier in space. Because we have such a rich community of engineers here, it's easy for new ventures to get their start in Seattle. And Blue Origin is an example of that. Blue Origin was started up uh, a couple of decades ago by Jeff Bezos, the CEO of Amazon. Uh, Jeff says that he spends a uh, billion dollars or more every year on supporting Blue Origin as they develop their rockets and a lunar lander. That's a mock-up of the lunar lander at Blue Origin's new headquarters in Kent, Washington. Uh, I've mentioned Boeing. Aerojet Rocketdyne is one of the oldest companies that's been doing rocketry in Seattle. It was, it was started up in Seattle and went to Redmond uh, in the 1950s and 60s, and they have uh, thrusters that have been on perhaps every pl interplanetary probe that NASA has ever flown. Uh, first mode is an example of a space startup. These are folks who uh, come from places like JPL, uh, from planetary resources and set up their own engineering company uh, near Pike Place Market and are doing very well. They're involved with the Mars rover mission in 2020. They've got, uh, they've got a role in a project that aims to put a lunar rover uh, on, on the moon for uh, NASA's, to prepare for NASA's Artemis program. SpaceX, uh, Elon Musk brought uh, the satellite operation for SpaceX up to the Seattle area because he said it was too hard to get the engineers that he wanted to move down to Los Angeles. And so they're working on the Starlink satellites. They're putting out uh, 60 satellites every two weeks to, to launch. There's a Starlink launch that's coming up from Cape Canaveral uh, in a couple days. And so they aim to put up thousands of satellites and it's happening right here in the Seattle area. Space Flight Industries has their own satellite constellation, Black Sky, that they're working on. They have a satellite factory down in Tukwila. And so uh, the Jet City is not only the Jet City anymore. It's the Space City. It's the Satellite City. 
on biomedicine, uh, we've got a rich heritage. Uh, Paul Allen, who passed away in October 2018, uh, was a supporter of the Allen Institute, which started out with brain science and then has moved on to cell science and immunology as well. The Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center is very active in uh, cancer treatment and immunotherapy. It's basically where bone marrow transplants got their start, and they've continued uh, in research in, uh, in therapies that take advantage of the body's own immune system to cure cancer. Uh, and they're also working on projects for an HIV vaccine. Uh, they have other uh, work that they do with infectious diseases. Uh, there's the Infectious Disease Re Research Institute. Uh, this sort of work is uh, getting more prominence now with the rise of the coronavirus epidemic. Uh, Institute for Systems Biology uh, concentrates on scientific wellness. It was founded by Lee Hood, who was uh, one of the pioneers in biotech and uh, is looking for ways to kind of take advantage to big data to make you feel better. It's not just about curing illness, it's about promoting health. Pacific Northwest Region Research Institute concentrates on genetics and the Geneva Foundation, uh, based in the Tacoma area, uh, concentrates on innovations in biomedicine that particularly benefit members of the military. Computer science, that's the C in our ABCs, very strong because of Microsoft, and uh, also because Amazon is such a rising force in, uh, in frontiers like AI, cloud computing, big data. You've got AI2, Allen Institute for Artificial Intelligence, which was founded by Paul Allen and continues uh, to do research and to spin off uh, companies that concentrate on AI. Uh, Facebook AI research has uh, established a beachhead in Seattle because uh, Seattle is so prominent in AI cloud and big data. Same with Google Cloud AI. They've turned the South Lake Union neighborhood into a huge uh, tech area. I if you go down there, uh, you'll really find it interesting to, to walk by Amazon, Facebook, Google. Uh, but if you try to drive through there at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, God help you, because it's really getting jammed up down there. Microsoft Research has been uh, clicking along for decades. They have facilities at Cambridge, in England, in China, but their main facility is in Redmond. And so they also are working on AI, quantum computing, cloud computing. NVIDIA recently opened up a robotics laboratory in Seattle. And the same reasoning uh, goes behind all this, is this is where the engineers are, this is where the heritage for computer science is, and that's why you've got every computer company in the world looking at Seattle. Global health, a uh, huge priority for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Uh, and so they work on vaccines for HIV, for malaria, anti-malaria uh, techniques, including genetic uh, engineering of mosquitoes to try to eliminate the malaria threat. BGI USA is a Chinese company uh, focusing on genomics that recently uh, established a lab in the Seattle area. Global Good is a very interesting joint venture involving Bill Gates as well as Intellectual Ventures, which was founded uh, by, uh, co-founded by Microsoft executive Nathan Mervold, and they do things to benefit uh, the public good through uh, global health uh, and focusing on one of the things that they uh, have been working on is a mosquito zapper. Uh, you put this thing up and it automatically scans for a mosquito and zaps it with a laser. Uh, but they're working on more serious things too like AI diagnosis of cancer. Uh, one of their projects uh, found a better rate of diagnosis using AI than not using AI. Uh, PATH, sustainable solutions, uh, working on appropriate technologies for the developing world that benefit global health. And uh, there's just a grab bag of uh, other, uh, other research institutions. In fact, uh, I probably shouldn't call it a grab bag because these are very respected research institutions in the Seattle area. University of Washington, we've mentioned. Washington State University in Pullman is very active 
in, uh, in research since they're a land-grant university. They focus on agricultural research. I have to mention that my daughter got her degree in entomology from WSU and is doing very well actually at Penn State now, but, but uh, WSU is where it's at if you're interested in the sorts of technologies that will help feed the world in the future. Geoengineers, I just added that as an example of a private company that's doing a lot of work uh, in geoengineering. We have a lot of companies like that in the Seattle area uh, that maybe you haven't heard of but are, are just really part of the research and engineering ecosystem. Vulcan Technology and Science is uh, Paul Allen's main legacy when it comes to uh, doing uh, work in conservation, uh, applying technology to saving coral reefs. They're doing a huge coral reef survey that takes advantage of satellite imagery and, and big data to track the health of the coral reefs around the world uh, for decades to come. So uh, this is just kind of a quick aerobic uh, rundown on what the Seattle research community looks like. But uh, I, I hope that you take a look at everything that's being done in this area. I've actually set up uh, a little web site where you can download this presentation and get hot links to all the institutions that I've, I've mentioned. I, I hope you'll write down a or take a smartphone photo of this slide so that you can go back and check out everything that the Seattle area has to offer. And I think you'll be seeing more of that over the next few days here at the AAAS meeting. So I, I hope you enjoy your time. And speaking of time, we got three minutes. Thank you, Alan. So how many of you are from this area in the audience? No? Yep. And how many are thinking of moving here? <laughs> OK. Um, so we've got another group coming right up. If you're interested in talking to anybody from any of these institutions, PNNL has a booth over there. I have a list of speakers who will be here if you want to talk to people in particular fields. There are UW and others around. So thank you very much for your attention. Have fun at the conference. <laughs>